that type of budget, you should have two riders that are capable of winning. Because Chris, Chris, one crash, boom, he's out. What went wrong last year? I crashed. <laughs> I fell off my bike. Halfway through the massage, there's a knock on the door, and it's Ryder. Standing there with a cup for me. I made you a juice, Dave. What's quite worrying is we're still in Derbyshire, mm. and it feels like we've been cycling for a week. Morale good, though? No, not really. With exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I am with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Daniel Freeb. Hello. Looking around the table here, and also British Euro Sports own Rob Hatch. Hello, hello. Rob, just before you head off for three weeks at the Giro d'Italia, looking forward to that? Cannot wait. Sean Kelly's Greg Ario for three weeks, honoured to be there. Well, we'll be looking ahead to the Giro in this podcast. We'll hear from Lionel in a moment with his weekly roundup. But first of all, Lionel, where are we? We're in Italia Uno on Charlotte Street. I'm reliably informed, one of the very few authentic Italian cafes in the capital. I noticed on the menu board there's a sandwich campagnolo. That's a little cycling connection. There's some Italian football shirts on the wall as well. And they've got the bunting up, the tricolor bunting, red, white and green Italian flags up, presumably for the Giro. As a bunting, maybe we'll hear some more bunting news later in the podcast. I'm going to give Daniel a heart attack in a moment by ordering a flat white coffee, <laughs> which it might be a first for this place. From tomorrow night, you'll be able to make your own. You revealed exclusively earlier that you're doing a barista course tomorrow <laughs> night. Yeah, I've got my fake beard for that. Well, Daniel, will they do me a deep pan pizza in here, do you think, <laughs> with uh, chicken wings? That's very Italian, isn't it? Okay, without any further ado, let's hear a little more soberly from Lionel with the weekly roundup. It's been a big week for cycling in Britain with the first Tour de Yorkshire. Huge crowds turned out to watch all three days of racing as Sky's Lars Petter Nordhaug took control by winning the opening leg in Scarborough ahead of four other riders. The next day, Moreno Hofland won in York and Ben Hermans took the final stage in Leeds, but it was a Norwegian rider Nordhaug who took the overall honours. Louise Mahe won the women's race, an 80km circuit event in York, pipping Eileen Rowe by a matter of inches. Just over the Pennines, in Manchester's velodrome, Alex Dowsett broke Rowan Dennis's world hour record, elevating the mark to 52.937 kilometres, a month or so ahead of Bradley Wiggins' attempt, which will be in the London velodrome on June the 7th. Dowsett becomes the third British rider, after Graham O'Brien and Chris Boardman, to hold the world hour record. Back on the road, Russia's Ilnur Zakarin won the Tour of Romandy in Switzerland, turning in an impressive, if surprising, time trial result to hold off Simon Spilak and stretch his lead over third-placed Chris Froome on the final day. Team Sky's week had started off well as they won the team time trial. There were a couple of stage wins for Michael Albacini, one for Thibaut Pino, and Tony Martin won that final time trial, but it was a week that belonged to Zakarin, who will now go to the Giro d'Italia for Catuza. Perhaps Zakarin won't like the fact that many people mentioned that he had tested positive for an anabolic steroid back in 2009 before he turned professional. The Tour of Turkey concluded with Mark Cavendish taking his tally of stage wins for the week to three, while Christian Djurasek, a Croatian rider with the Lampre team, won overall. Now all eyes turn to the Giro d'Italia, which starts on Saturday, May the 9th, with a 17.6 km team time trial from San Lorenzo al Mar to San Remo. There's a lumpy first week, a more mountainous middle week, which concludes with a finish at Madonna di Campiglio and a very difficult final week, which features mountain stages to Aprica, Cervinia and Sestriere before the final stage from Turin to Milan on Sunday, May the 31st. Who's going to win? Well, the leading favourites are Alberto Contador, Fabio Aru, Rigoberto Uran and Richie Port. We'll be analysing the Giro each week on the Cycling Podcast, but for now it's back to the show. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for The Cycling Podcast. Okay, here we are. We're looking ahead to the Giro, but we're also talking about a lot of racing that's been going on. Tour de Yorkshire, the first ever Tour de Yorkshire. Daniel and I were both there. Also the Tour de Romandy, which produced a bit of an upset. We start with Yorkshire. Daniel, we went up to Yorkshire. Astonishing scenes there. Maybe not too surprising, given the, the crowds at the Tour de France last year, and this was the legacy event, but not perhaps a star-studded field. There was Bradley Wiggins, of course, Team Sky, Marcel Kittel, very briefly. Were you surprised just at the, the level of interest there was up there? The crowds were almost Tour de France-sized. 
Yeah, slightly inconsistent with the quality of the field, as you said. I mean, Kittle was there um, for his brief cameo. Blinken, you missed it. Thomas Vokler was there. Sky had a decent team. Obviously, Ben Swift, unfortunately, crashed out on the first stage. And the race itself was extremely exciting on the first day, and it almost stole the thunder of the two subsequent days because everything else after that seemed like a bit of a an anticlimax. You know, we know how good Sky are at, at leading a race and, and sort of shutting a race down, and that's exactly what they did on what we expected was going to be a very dramatic final stage but didn't prove to be that yeah interesting uh, Lars Petter Nordaug won the stage the Norwegian rider on Team Sky their plan B I suppose after Ben Swift crashed he's returned to Team Sky this year after a couple of years at Rabobank Belkin and I think I spoke to him after stage one and, and he said that you know the evidence of that being the right decision was in the fact that he was wearing the leader's jersey I suppose what was quite interesting was Sky's competence the way that they did control the race and the way that they improvised with Dagnan and Nordag sort of taking responsibility when Swift crashed out because we have seen them on British roads mess up quite spectacularly in the past. They won the Tour of Britain with Bradley Wiggins of course a couple of years ago last year wasn't it 2013 I think it was but consistently Sky didn't really do it at the Tour of Britain and this was a very controlled very professional performance it, it was a good it was quite an exciting race that first stage was good the, the second stage was a sprinter's stage third stage was brutally hard and, and made it quite interesting it was we noticed as well daniel that bmc were there with quite a strong team and i think there was a turning point in the race on that first stage where greg van avermaet was trying to get up to that leading break which had samuel sanchez also bmc in it and the fact that they didn't have race radios meant there could be no communication up to Sanchez to tell him that Van Avermaet was just off the back. Greg Van Avermaet and Steve Cummings, had they made the junction at that point, the race might have been different because there then would have been two BMC riders up there. As it was, Sky really took advantage of numerical advantage. Lionel, did you see much of it? Well, I saw stage one and stage three. I was otherwise engaged on the Saturday watching Watford not win the championship against Sheffield Wednesday. We had our own tour to Yorkshire in other sorts I suppose but the two days that I did see were absolutely terrific hats off to whoever planned the route I'm not sure who it was Gary Verity now known as Gary Truth <laughs> because you have to <laughs> Gary Verity if he had a hand in plotting that route then he did a spectacular job on the first day and the third day arguably the fact that it was so hard was balanced out by the fact that Team Sky was so strong they had numbers to control the race and really the list of contenders had been boiled down to really only Sammy Sanchez and um, Thomas Vauclair really but the first day's finish that run into Scarborough wasn't it not only did it look phenomenal on television the weather really helped you know it was quite gritty weather it was uh, it was a bit like a cross between an Ardennes classic and a kind of uh, a tour of Flanders albeit minus cobbled stones um, but the five man finish was a real tactical perhaps one for the purists more but just watching the sort of textbook moves go Vauclair trying to play and the sort of you know sandbagging a bit but choosing the moments to make his efforts Sky having a numerical advantage Samuel Sanchez probably being the stronger and of course then Nordhaug played it perfectly thanks to Philip Dijkman and pulled off the sprint but watching that all play out over the last 10 kilometres or so was one of the highlights of the racing season so far and trumps anything really that I saw in the classics I mean, one of the effects of having the involvement of ASO is that teams come wanting to make a good impression. They don't just turn up. There's a huge change in British cycling over the last decade. You know, I remember the first few editions of the Tour of Britain. You'd have teams and certain big names would come along and, and really not engage with it at all. I remember Andreas Cloden lasting not much longer than Marcel Kittel in one stage of the Tour of Britain. And then I think he packed as close to an airport as possible and flew home. And that was fairly typical, whereas... All these teams that turned up, BMC, not only with good riders, but with Andy Reese, Jim Okovitz, Alan Piper, the sort of big heads of state in that team, were all there and all very keen, A, to, I think, make a good impression with ASO, and B, also because they recognise that Britain is now a very important market. And it's made a great start, hasn't it? And the field will presumably only get better as the race becomes more established. And, you know, I think we were slightly sceptical last week of the, the merits of a three-day race. What exactly was it? I think the three days encouraged three days of quite aggressive racing, and it was, it was entertaining to watch. Shall we, let's touch briefly on Marcel Kittel, because I spoke to Mark Reef, as director sportif. Obviously, huge questions about Kittel and his 
condition. Um, he's been struggling with illness most of the year. We've made comparisons in the past with Mark Cavendish's Anis Horribles in 2010, but really it was nothing compared to this. I mean, Cavendish was winning races. He was below par. He wasn't the same Cavendish as he'd been in 2009, but the year that Kittle's having is a complete washout at the moment. Daniel, what are your thoughts on Kittle? Well, I think we'll hear from Mark Reef, the race coach at Giant Alperson, in a second, who will explain how Kittle has never really recovered from this virus, that he contracted prior to the Tour de Qatar, Tour de Qatar, is it? Tour of Qatar? Tour von Qatar. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to go. What we're Tour. supposed to call any races anymore. And he probably shouldn't have raced there. The first two stages in Qatar were some of the hardest days of racing this season, and it really battered Kittel. And his immune system didn't recover. He thought he was getting better at one point. Again, started training too quickly. Was very very motivated to come back. It was too soon, and he's fallen ill again. And now he's really engaged in a race against time to get ready for the Tour de France, isn't he? Well, I spoke to Mark Reef at the Giro de Yorkshire um, <laughs> on the day after Kittel packed the race, just about Kittel's state of health and what his prospects now are of going to Tour and, and repeating his success there last year. From the cobbles of Belgium to the tops of the Alps, you're listening to The Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Freed. How was he? Yes, I mean, is he back to full health and just missing racing, or what's the word? Yeah, at the moment, uh, he is. He's just lacking still some training and some race kilometers. So, yeah, that's how it is at the moment. As a, as a team and the doctor happy that he is, you know, 100% healthy again? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, he's one of our big guys. And, uh, of course, we are happy that he's 100% healthy again and that he also uh, is back in the race again. I mean, we knew up front that this could happen. It's not easy to restart here in uh, Yorkshire, but it's good that we know now also how he is and um, yeah, that we have some work to do. How is it affecting him mentally, you know, to be struggling as we saw him struggling yesterday? A guy who had such an amazing season last year and has really struggled to, to follow up on that this year and obviously had health problems and so on. How is his mood, how is his confidence affected by that? Of course, it's doing something. I mean, uh, the last uh, three, four years, it went in one line up. And um, yeah, he made some really nice results also, yes, uh, last year uh, again. And of course, when, yeah, when he cannot deliver that and when he's also seeing people around him winning, uh, winning races, uh, other sprinters, and then like John uh, Deinko winning uh, uh, Milan Saremo and Paris Roubaix, of course, he also wants to show himself and that he's uh, still one of the big guys. And of course, that affects him then uh, on that way. But uh, yeah, he also knows when, when we do all the things what we plan now to do uh, on a good way, for sure he will be again on, uh, on that level that he can uh, deliver again some, uh, some nice results. We, we saw him climbing the team car. Has he, has he gone home now? Is it, is it yeah. another block of training for him now? Yeah, he's now going home. Yeah, the coming days he's going to train. Uh, he's continuing what we plan to do. I mean, we plan to do here the race, of course. That's now a bit uh, a change in, in the training schedule. But for the rest, we're having a line now... Uh, for him and yeah we're just uh, keeping that line when do you expect to see him back racing again that's probably going to be in uh, in california so confident that he can go to the the tour and and be in the kind of shape we saw him in last year we are not uh, uh doubting about that at the moment no so it, i mean we think that it's possible you've got obviously john denko but another great sprinter perhaps not the pure sprinter that marcel kittel is but that first week in the tour in particular there's some quite technical quite difficult finishes that might suit him there'll be a dilemma for the team in deciding who to back or you know presumably they'll both go to the tour but if you take Marcel you're really you know you're committing yourself to supporting him aren't you in, in the sprint finishes will there yeah. be a dilemma do you think for the team at the moment not yet no no at the moment we are going to uh, to the tour with uh, with both of them and uh, at the moment there's no dilemma yet so we heard there from Mark Reef, the director sportif at Giant Alpsen very young director sportif he is Dennis Bergkamp look alike, isn't he? He does look like Dennis Bergkamp, yes. But he's not afraid of flying, I believe. Anyway, Daniel, I think you've got some stuff on Mark Cavendish and Kittel and some gossip, some rumour, have you? It's more than rumour. It's very much substantiated, exclusive news. This is real scoops. The real sort of... We're venturing into Ben and Jerry territory. Hit us with it. <laughs> right, so just to recap, uh, Mark Cavendish is out of contract. He's made no secret of the fact he liked to say at Essex. We know this, we've spoken about it. Thus far, there have been two sticking points. One, the fact his current wage is very substantial. Two, Etics have a lot of expensive riders whose contracts are up. They've got Steve Bar's contracts up, Alaphilippe, the revelation of the Arden Classics. 
The Polish world champion. We'll pass over to Rob to pronounce that. Michał Kwiatkowski. There we go. Cavendish himself and Boonen. So the situation is as follows. His manager, Simon Bailiff, Cavendish's manager, has made it clear to Patrick Lefebvre that they want to negotiate a, a contract renewal. Lefebvre has seemed open to that, but he's laid out various provisos in every interview and also every conversation with them. He said that Cavendish needed to have a good Sam Remo, he needed to have a good Gent Vavelgum, and he needed to do something at the tour, possibly beat Kittel a few times at the tour. But Cavendish wants things sorted before the Tour de France. Understandably so. This is slightly destabilising, you know, not knowing what he's going to be doing next year. But he and his manager have felt that Lefebvre is trying to keep his options open, shopping around, looking what other riders are on the market. was very, very keen on Alexander Kristoff before he renewed with Katuja. Understandably then, Cav is keen to get things moving, but Lefebvre has been fairly elusive. They were supposed to have a meeting on the 31st of March, Cavendish's manager and Lefebvre. Lefebvre cancelled at the very last minute. He hasn't provided any other dates since then or about when they could meet on another occasion. Cavendish's manager has felt he's had no other option but to start talking to other teams, and he's spoken to a few so far. He's spoken to Cannondale, BMC, Trek, uh, the Tour of Turkey last week to MTN Quebec, Brian Smith. That came about as a strange incident at the finish line, I think one day, or maybe at the start one day. Cavendish was um, debating with Brian Smith, the MTN manager, what had happened in the sprint the previous day, and Brian said to him, well, don't worry, that won't happen next year when you're riding for my team. And it was intended as a joke, but um, Cavendish's ears pricked up and said well actually maybe you should speak to my manager about that so those conversations might well take place well, Brian got straight on the front here <laughs> well no actually I think I think um, Simon Bailiff Cavendish and manager has spoken to him or certainly made contact with him in the last 48 hours or so however with Kittle pulling out of the Tour de Yorkshire very early Cavendish's manager felt that this is an opportune moment to go to Patrick Lefebvre and start to make things happen. So I think he's made a written proposal to Lefebvre in the last 48 hours or so. Originally, Cavendish's manager was suggesting that they renew on the same amount of money. Cavendish has said to Simon Bailey, no, I haven't delivered quite what I hoped to deliver and expected to deliver at Etix. I will take a substantial pay cut. I will take a pay cut of over half a million euros to stay at Etix. That is how keen I am to stay. And that is the deal that they have gone back to Lefebvre with. It's a three-year deal they're looking at. And really, the ball is in his court. We know he wants to stay. I think he probably will stay because you look at Etix, the riders that they are going to renew contracts with, they will probably renew with Stebar. They have renewed with Alaphilippe. But they're going to save quite a lot of money, I think, by letting Mikhail, the Mikhail, the Polish world champion, Rob. Michał Kwiatkowski. Kwiatkowski. They are going to save a substantial amount of money by letting him leave because his manager, Giuseppe Acquadro, known by Gianni Savio, is pasticciere, the pastry chef. That's the story for another podcast, perhaps. But he has quoted a ridiculous price to Patrick Lefebvre. I have it on good authority that he has asked for €4 million Euros a year from Lefebvre. And Lefebvre has laughed him out of town for the moment. The Polish world champion will end up signing for Sky. That's a lot of pastry. I confidently <laughs> predict. Interesting stuff, Daniel. Very interesting. The level of detail in that scoop <laughs> suggests that Daniel's on some kind of fat percentage for getting a deal done. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Let's keep an eye on that Cavendish situation, shall we, Daniel? Keep us posted. And let's talk about the Tour de Romandie. The, the, tour, the, tour, tour, the Tour de Romandie finished at the weekend. I should just say, I mean, that's just all the result of excellent journalism and relationships that go back years, isn't it? You know, that's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. Tour de Romandie, OK? Won by Ilner Zakarin, the Katusha writer, 25 years old. Uh, not a name that's familiar to many people. A bit of a surprise, to say the least, particularly as it was uh, a bit of a showdown, or build as a showdown, between the, the Tour de France favourites, Vincenzo Nibali, Chris Froome, Nairo Quintana, Thibaut Pino as well, rode very well, finished fourth overall, won the sort of Queen stage. First victory in three years, I think, for Thibaut Pino. Almost three years. The last time was 2012, I think. But Zacharine, a controversial winner, because age 19 he tested positive for a steroid, no less. Quite unusual in cycling to test positive for an anabolic steroid, a drug more associated with 
bodybuilders and certainly wanting to put on mass sprinters and so on. So quite unusual. It's quite a strange case. And he is quite a strange case. This is his first year with Katusha as well. But Rob, you got any insight on Zakarin? Well, when he was signed from uh, Rusvelo, he came back with Rusvelo after his suspension. He won the Russian um, time trial championship in 2013. He's ridden really well over the past couple of years. Really good result last year, winning the Tour of Azerbaijan. The talk this year is that he's lost 10 kilos. He's done a lot of work on his uh, climbing ability in the mountains. He's always had that, that strong and strength uh, in the time trial. But um, Ekimov was really talking him up as one of the riders to watch at the start of the season. Uh, Zakarin said, no, this guy is going to be important for us, he's going to be big for us, and his, his season peak was supposed to be in Romandy. So I'm not sure what he's going to achieve in the Giro. Can he keep that excellent level of form up for a month? There'll be a lot of people thinking, no, probably hoping that he doesn't keep that form up for a month, given his history and what have you, but... He, he rode exceptionally well in Romodi. He was second on the Queen stage behind Thibaut Pino, strength in the attack. The time trial, he was scarily good in the time trial, finishing really, really close to um, Tony Martin in the well, end. Especially as he needed a bike change. I mean, that was unbelievable. He, he, he wrapped his chain around the, the chain set and needed a, needed a bike change. He was very cool in, in, the, in, 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 that, in the bike change. He, he didn't seem to panic. La- even laid his bike down gently against the car. And uh, as you say, rode an extraordinary time trial, finished just behind Tony Martin. I think at the top of the cobbled climb, it was about a kilometre long climb on the Tour Romandy time trial, there was uh, a ramp of 5% followed by a ramp of 10%. So it wasn't an easy time trial, it was raining hard, it was pretty miserable weather in Lausanne. And he was 1.6 seconds behind Tony Martin before the problem. He still finished very close because everybody was then thinking that Simon Spielach was then finally going to go and win the Tour de Romandie on the road, given the fact that the only time he previously won it was because Valverde had, had it expunged from his results in 2010, I think it was. So he rode fantastically well. He's been at um, he's been altitude at Sierra Nevada in, in Spain. He's been preparing for Romandie, and on the back of that form, he's now going to go to the Giro d'Italia. One of the favourites, um, the, the guys we were expecting, I mean, Chris Froome's run won the last two Tours of Romandie, Look, decent form, but not, not the sort of shape he's been the last couple of years. Disappointing final time trial for him as well. It was very sort of treacherous conditions, but he was beaten by Simon Yates, for example, the young, the young British rider. Um, and, you know, he finished third in the end, which was best of the, the Grand Tour contenders, I suppose. N- N- Nibali was disappointing. Quintana was also slightly disappointing. Lionel, did you see much of Romandy or what are your thoughts on, on the performances of those guys? Well, I didn't actually see any of the Tour of Romandy. So oh, well, that's enough from you. Yeah. Um, but it's a peculiar race, isn't it? I have to say, with the Tour of Yorkshire on, I didn't go out of my way to look for it and, you know, I followed the results. Um, but it is a, it's a funny race to have a World Tour status, really, because it seems to be riders who are just coming up in time for the Giro d'Italia and riders who are just kind of coming off their peak from the Arden Classics and then the likes of Simon Spilak and uh, Zakarin, the Russian rider who's clearly targeted it. Um, it. It's not a race that really sort of ignites for me, I have to admit. Daniel, any thoughts on what can we read into the performance of Nibali, Quintana, Froome from Romandy, do you think? Well, Richard, I must confess, I spoke to our good friend Chiros Conyamilio this morning about... Um, good plug for the T-shirt, Sarah Daniel. Yes, um, and more of which later. About Nibali's performance in Romandy. Although, on paper, Nibali wasn't any worse than he had been in Romandy in 2014, uh, Chiro felt he was very disappointed, almost slightly dejected at the finish. Um, in Lausanne on Sunday, he expected to go much better in Romandy. So, slightly worrying from his point of view, I think. Yeah, well, and Quintana, I think we expect a lot more from him. Rob? Um, perhaps, but we've got to remember that this is the, the end of the first part of Quintana's season. He's due to go back to Colombia after this. He's going to spend some time at home preparing the Tour de France. Rather like we've seen Rigoberto Oran spend the last month and a half at home in, in Colombia preparing the Giro d'Italia. Um, I don't think Quintana will be too disappointed given the fact that he's already shown a really strong peak early in the season and, and he's now going to go for the second half of his season. And, and of course, we've seen how well Moby Star are riding as a team. I don't think he's got any worries, really. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast and British Eurosport, the home of cycling. 
Okay, so coming up on British Eurosport in the next few days and weeks, 6th of May begins the Tour of Azerbaijan. And then on the same day, 6th of May, the Four Days of Dunkirk begins. A couple of days later, we've got three weeks of the Giro d'Italia live on Eurosport, and that's yourself, Rob Hatch, with Sean Kelly throughout. Cannot wait. Yeah, uh, Sean alongside me for the Giro d'Italia, just as we were last year, but of course, we're going to be bigger and better this year. We're going to have Giro Extra as well with uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher on site, giving us a bit of preview, a bit of analysis as well after the race, which cannot wait for. I wish you showed that much enthusiasm about emptying the dishwasher at the home of cycling sometimes. We're talking about both the homes of cycling here. For those that don't know, Daniel and Rob are flatmates and they refer to their abode as the home of cycling, which, handily enough, is also the strapline for British Eurosport, home of cycling. So, so it's nice and easy for Rob to remember, isn't it? Yeah, and on a more corporate note, <laughs> hashtag home of cycling for all your suggestions and tweets during the Giro as well, please. Sticking with the corporate theme, we launched our T-shirts a couple of weeks ago. Didn't see any of them at the Tour de Yorkshire, disappointingly, but then it was absolutely freezing. So maybe people were wearing them underneath their outer clothing. Daniel, we presented one to Christian Prudhomme, didn't we? And you're going to present now a little piece of work that you've been uh, working very hard on the last couple of weeks. Daniel. Well, here it is. I mean, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Um, This is the Prudy... Chiro Ibiza remix summer 2015 um, it's it's a form of promotion for the t-shirts I'm not sure of this this has been troubling me for the last two weeks why anyone would want a t-shirt associating themselves with us however we've sold a few they are very nice nice quality dare I say they're, they're quite cool looking and Prudy Christian Prudhomme certainly um, liked his didn't he Rich he sent us a very nice text message after we gave him his humongous bunting t-shirt at the Tour de Yorkshire. Anyway, here is the Pretty Remix. That's true. But the only places I saw that bunting was in Yorkshire. 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 I was not really concentrated on the race. I must confess, uh, I must confess, uh, I must confess, uh, I was not really concentrated on the race. I must confess. Uh, is that bunting? Is that bunting? Was in Yorkshire? Was in Yorkshire? Was in Yorkshire? Humongous. It was unbelievable. Uh, it was unbelievable. Humongous. Is that bunting? I must confess. Uh, uh, it was incredible. Undeniable. Humongous. I must confess. Uh, is that bunting? Is that bunting? Was in Yorkshire. Was in Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think a moment of stunned silence is required after hearing that. <laughs> Lionel. Well, you, you look utterly bemused. Well, I mean, clearly it's been a tough week, Daniel. You had a lot else on. Is that what the kids are listening to these days, Daniel? Is that what they listen to in the home of cycling? I don't know. All I say is that Chiro and Prudy were, worked very hard in the studio all last week to prepare that. And we're very grateful for the, for the collaboration of R&B star Brian McKnight as well, who doesn't know he features in that remix. But hopefully we get away with that on, on a copyright score. Hopefully we'll see a picture from Christian Prudhomme of him wearing his humongous bunting t-shirt. He did send us a text, as you mentioned. Thank you for the t-shirt, Daniel and Richard. I love bunting and Yorkshire is gorgeous. Humongous, of course. My new English expressions. A dash of milk, please. Or if you fancy a drink. It's almost as useful as the other words. All the best, C.H. Prudy. I got an email as well. because Last week we had a, a little joke about Gary Verity and Gary Truth and I without really thinking about it, said a translation of Christian Prudhomme's name would be Christian Proud Man. I did have an email from John Loney, a fellow Scot exiled in Brittany, and it says some nice things about the podcast. In relation to your discussion of the Tour de Yorkshire, da 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 da, I feel I must point out a glaring error. You said that Christian Prudhomme was Christian Proud Man. I'm afraid it's far worse than that. He's Christian member of an industrial tribunal. So I'll remember that for future mentions. <laughs> but yeah, a reminder, the T-shirts can be purchased at thiscyclingpodcast.com 
19 pounds. Another little advert that Friends of the Podcast scheme carries on, and you can become a friend of the podcast for five pounds. That's for the whole of 2015, and it gains you access to 11 special podcasts. We've done three already. The fourth one will be coming out very soon, and others will follow. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. So let's look ahead to the Giro d'Italia, the first of the Grand Tours of the season, a race that we all, I think, really look forward to, Daniel and Rob in particular, perhaps. Daniel, what are your thoughts ahead of the Giro? Who are your favourites? I mean, it's, it's a race that Alberto Contador, I think, will start as the, the favourite. His form is a little bit of a mystery. He's not been on fire in the same way that he was last year. He says that's been deliberate, that he's building slowly towards the Giro Tour double. So that makes sense. Fabio Aru, again, a little bit of a mystery, the revelation of last year's Giro, but it's form a little bit of a mystery this year. Who else can we look out for in this year's Giro? You've named the main contenders, Rich, of course, is Rigoberto Aran, who's finished second in the last two Giro d'Italia. Interesting disparities between the number of race days these four contenders have had this year. There's a graphic in La Gazzetta today which tells us that Contador has raced 19 days so far this year. Aru is 15, Uran 25 and Richie Port 33. And, and Richie Port is also down to ride the Tour de France. Um, so he will probably be going into the Tour de France with around 60 race days, you would imagine, which seems like an awful lot. Uh, Richie Port obviously is in outstanding form. He's um, won... Are you going to help me out here? Paris-Nice this year. Um, Catalonia. Catalonia. He's putting together the sort of sequence in stage races that Wiggins did in 2000. 12, framed in 2013. However, in my mind, there's still a major question mark about his ability in Tours. I'm just going to read out now his finishes thus far in his pro career in major tours. And he finished 7th in the 2010 Giro, 80th in the 2011 Giro, 71st in the 2011 Tour, 34th in the following year's Tour, 68th in the Vuelta 2012, 19th in the 2013 Tour, and 23rd in last year's tour so apart from that first Giro in which he I think he gained about 11 minutes in a break on a very rainy day in the in L'Aquila yeah he has not really troubled the scorers as far as the top 10 is concerned he came out of the Tour de France last year a bit of a broken man you know he took on the leadership of the team when Froome crashed out and obviously the the team Sky supported him he was he was very well placed for the first half of the race, um, but really fell apart. I understand he's a new man since then. He's found love. He's uh, lost quite a bit of weight, and he's certainly been on on fire this year. But he's a sort of more settled character. He's happier, and he's been in great form this year. Giro del Trentino as well. He won too, didn't he? So he's had the kind of season this year that you know Froome has had in previous years. Certainly, 2013 on his way to winning the Tour. Yeah, Sky have won six stage races already this year and Bort's won three of them. He won in Paris-Nice, exceptional in the final time trial, of course. Really good on the mountain stage with Geraint Thomas supporting him. He's not going to have Geraint Thomas at the Giro, but Sky, I think, have shown that they're so confident in Richie Bort's form at the minute. They've given him a bit of a dream team for the Giro. He's got the likes of Koenig with him, Mikel Nieve even changing his plans as well. We've, we're hearing as well that the team's been announced today and that uh, Bernie Isles going to the Giro with him as well. So a serious, serious team for Sky this year at the Giro d'Italia. Maybe only Elia Viviani for the sprints is, is the man not dedicated to the overall. As far as Contador is concerned, you mentioned his form. Where is he? We're not quite sure. 19 race days. He's had three stage races. He hasn't won any of them yet. He did win a stage in uh, Andalusia back at, right at the start of the season in his first race. But he has had three top five finishes on general classification. He meant to come to the Giro a little bit undercooked this time. He's looking forward to that really hard final week where we've got Mortirolo, Sestria, all those sorts of mountains. One really interesting thing to look at their Giro team is that there's no Jesus Hernandez this year. And Hernandez is normally Contador's right-hand man. He's normally the man that escorts him to all of those Grand Tour successes that we've seen in the past. Is that political? Is that the team giving him a bit of a nudge after the whole Ghana Reese affair? We know that Contador was really vocal. Or Hernandez going to the Tour of California, is that his better preparation to be 100% for the Tour to support Contador? I think we'll find out over the next few weeks. But they've got a good team nonetheless. 
and of course other people such as Aru, Botavivo, you can't really count them out either despite the fact that in Aru's case in particular his form is an unknown and he's had all the rumblings on in the background, the illness he's been at Sestria at an altitude camp rather like uh, Contador spent three weeks on the top of Mount Tede in Tenerife it's funny coming into this year because Port is the only man who we know exactly where his form is everyone else is a bit of a doubt and I think in the last few years we haven't really had that we've had guys we've sort of known where everybody is and what they've had to do to improve or hold their form well, I think the key with the Giro, as ever, is the weather and the fact that the course looks very hard again, as it always does. starts with a team time trial to San Remo and then a sprint stage, but then it's straight into the climbs and stages that are lumpy, bumpy, will bring all of the GC riders to the fore earlier than perhaps they would like to. I've already seen Contador referring to not wanting to take on the pink jersey too early and having to defend it all the way through because he hasn't got, and none of the favourites have got their absolute A-teams back them because most of the top domestiques will be prepping for the Tour de France and will be saved for that. And then the clincher, the key stage really, the one that could well sort out the, the A team of climbers who will emerge over the course of the first 10 days will be the 52.9 kilometre time trial. I'm not sure what stage that is but it's around about the midway point in the race. And as there's no time trial in the final week, it could mean that the final mountain stages are a little bit more decisive than perhaps they are when you have a a mountain time trial which basically all that really does is confirm who is already the best climber so we might see a bit more aggressive racing in the final week if there's a close battle between two or three but there's such a long way to get to that point and as I said the weather has more of a factor at the Giro than at the Tour de France and the Vuelta. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Contador, when he announced his Giro Tour bid, it seemed like a very audacious attempt. It's not something anybody's done since Mark Pantani in 1998, win both the Giro and the Tour. But it's starting to look, if not sensible, then at least not crazy, because there isn't an outstanding favourite for the, the Tour de France, I don't think, as there has been the last couple of years. Nobody is in scintillating form. Contador, if he's done this right, if, as he says, he is a bit undercooked and that he will sort of gain form. I'm not sure if that's really possible. I've heard physiologists doubt that you can begin a, a grand tour at 80 or 90% and, and actually build your form through it. I'm not sure about that. But if, if he doesn't come out of the Giro too wasted, then you know he might be doing the right thing and he might be in a position to go to the tour and, and try to win it. Daniel, anything to add there from your perusing the pink pages of Gazeta della Sport? No, only that if you look back at... Contador's career, he managed with the Giro and the Vuelta, but on the occasions when he's tried to combine the Giro and the Tour, it's not worked particularly well. And he is getting older, he probably doesn't recover even quite as well as he once did. So you'd imagine that it'll be a tall order. In Yorkshire, I had a long conversation with Thierry Gouverneur, who's the sort of route designer now of the Tour de France. Uh, he feels very strongly that he, he has designed a route at the Tour de France this year, not deliberately, of course, but which favours um, Naira Quintana, and he's sort of said that Quintana will never have a better opportunity to win the Tour than this year. Pino looks good. We're sort of skipping ahead, but he's starting to look good as well. He looked good in Romandie, and it's not a, a Tour that favours time trials, and as he showed at, at Romandie, the time trial is the discipline that, that certainly lets him down a little bit. One thing that they seem to have improved on at Francais des Jeux, though, is the team time trial. There is a team time trial in the Tour de France, and I think they were well in the top five in the Tour de Romandy team time trial, so that, that's something of a positive note. And alongside him, a man who did look really good in Romandy was Steve Morabito, his brand-new support worker, his brand-new deluxe domestique, if you like. He's come from helping Cadell Evans, and I think he may well have taken some of his expertise in the team time trial over to Francais des Jeux as well. Actually, there was over the last week, we've seen Francais des Jeux have not had a great start to the year. The other team that has had a terrible start to the year, Lotto NL Jumbo, won their first World Tour race of the year with Moreno Hoffland at the Tour de Yorkshire. So one or two of these teams finally starting to get on the score sheet. But think of Saxo are a team that have not clicked at all this year, and that's got to be a factor at the Giro, I would have thought. On the other hand, you mentioned the very strong Team Sky team at, at the Giro, and you know, we spoke in the first part about Team Sky at the Tour de Yorkshire and just how competent they were. They have got the Midas touch this year, it seems. I mean, whatever team they put out there, they seem to be performing extremely well. You've just reminded me, Rich, of something I wanted to say about Cavendish as well. Um, when assessing the value of someone like Cavendish, how much a team should be paying him nowadays, um, you mentioned there Lotto, Jumbo. Um, we see this every year. There are one or two or three teams that really get stuck into a rut 
very early in the year and they find it very hard to generate any momentum. You know, they'll often end the season with only a handful of wins and, and it really all starts to go wrong from the start. Now, if you look at the number of wins that Cavendish's teams have had since the start of his career, it goes 36, 77, 85, 64, 56, 51, 55, 62 there condensed in that is the value of having a guy who guarantees it doesn't matter if they're big wins small wins but someone who gets the ball rolling very quickly and that is one of the great values of someone like Cavendish I think so you're saying that Cavendish is part of that picture rather than you know that, that it all feeds into each other. I think he contributes much more than the individual wins that he himself has contributed I think he He's a contributor of great momentum to every team that he's in. I was interested when you when you were offering us those scant details on Cavendish's current contract situation. You mentioned Cannondale Garmin. Now, there's a team that could do that. We mentioned those other underperforming teams, but there's a team that's really not performing at all and doesn't really have a, a talisman as such. It, it's perhaps not in, in the past either, but they've always had a sort of small group of strong characters. We saw David Miller at the weekend, who's obviously retired now. I think he's a big loss to the team in terms of being a, a figurehead. And that's what they seem to be lacking. Cavendish at Cannondale Garmin. Can we see that? Well, Jonathan Vaught, as the manager of the team, has assured me that it can't happen. However, I understand that contact has been made more with the bike manufacturer, Cannondale. Just looking ahead to the Giro, I think it's a big race for them. Not so much in that I expect a lot from Ryder Hegedal, 2012 winner, who is nominally their captain in Italy. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how Davide Formolo gets on. One of the revelations, certainly the revelation of Italian cycling last year, Vortas has tipped him as a future Giro champion. Hasn't ridden fantastically well so far this year, but um, is staking much of his season on the Giro. And it would be nice to see him squeak inside the top 10, maybe. Ivan Basso really, really rates him. He talks him up heck of a lot last year. He was rooming with Ivan Basso in his first Neopro year at Cannondale, it was then. Liquid Gas, old Liquid Gas Cannondale. And mentioning Ivan Basso, one thing we forgot to mention for Alberto Contador, we said they have a strong team. Ivan Basso, how about that for a domestique? And when we've seen doing his work earlier on in the season in uh, Andalusia and Catalonia, okay, it didn't work particularly perfectly well for Contador in terms of winning the race. But Basso, with the freedom to just ride hard on the climbs, sit up with 10Ks to go maybe, that's going to be a scary proposition for a lot of the teams they're going to come up against. Yeah, and the thing about Contador is that he can win a race by riding quite defensively. We've seen that in the past when he came off his suspension and he came back and picked up winning Grand Tours without being in the absolute peak condition. He doesn't necessarily need to go out and be aggressive first. I'd expect to see Rigoberto Uran and Fabio Aru be more aggressive earlier and Contador just ride himself in and, and try and pick his moments in the devilishly hard final week. The only Giro that officially Alberto Contador has won now in 2008, he won it without winning a stage. He came into it on the back of all the problems that were happening at the time. He was, he was on holiday on the beach. Here. They booked him off, go and ride the Giro. He took the, the jersey on the 15th stage and he won it there. Of course, the other Giro that he will say he won was in 2011 when that was taken off him after the whole Clem Boutrell affair. But yeah, he, he can win without really being at his best, can't he? We know that. We should probably wrap up there. Have you got any more, Tad? Daniel, no... Lionel mentioned right at the start of the podcast in his weekly roundup that Louise Mahe won the women's race at the Tour de Yorkshire. Just a quick word on that because delighted to see Charlene Joyner, Katie Archibald and Eileen Rowe, three Scottish girls all up there performing very well. It was difficult to cover that race because the, the men's stage two began in Selby about 20 miles away at exactly the time that the women's race was going on. So it was very hard to cover both highlights an issue that we've talked about when they stage men's and women's races as part of the same race the logistics can be quite complicated more complicated than you would think Daniel it was especially hard to cover because did, hadn't you slunk off on a mini break with your wife by that point that was later Daniel that was that evening I was around for the whole of that day that was a that was a sneaky little comment there trying to get me in trouble not true at all and I was there on Sunday in Ilkley went to Ilkley <laughs> went to Ilkley to watch stage three, which was absolutely fantastic. Enough, calm down. Daniel gets like this when he's in these authentic Italian places. And also, just a quick word on Alex Dowsett, who set the new world air record. Again, Lionel mentioned that in the roundup. We've not talked about that in great depth because we are going to be talking a lot about the air record in the build up to Bradley Wiggins' attempt on it. But great respect, I think, to Alex Dowsett. You know, he had a, a real setback when he broke his collarbone aiming in his first 
attempt, which was end of February originally. So this this felt like a bit of an improvised effort, but he judged it perfectly well. Spoke to Chris Boardman last week. The interview with him will be played in a forthcoming podcast. But he was confident that Dowsett would break it because he felt that he understood the demands of the event, that he planned it properly, and he would be well prepared mentally as much as physically. But Rohan Dennis is top rider, the previous holder, Great ride by Alex Dowsett. Anything to add, Lionel? Well, only in that uh, it was a shame that Alex had broken his collarbone and had to reschedule it for the same weekend of the Tour de Yorkshire. I mean, in terms of getting the coverage that it perhaps deserved and merited in the national press, you know, that hampered it, certainly. But, you know, he's raised the bar and and, uh, he will be the record that Bradley Wiggins is going to try and break on June 7th, I think it is. It did get a token mention in the Spanish press, actually, with Movistar being involved. I know that the team has done a lot of work with uh, the equipment manufacturers, both the clothing and the bike manufacturers in Duran Canyon over the last uh, couple of years. They've noticeably improved in the time trial on the road, and I think Dowsett's been a big part of that. He's brought his expertise to the team, and it sounds like they're pretty happy for him to have another go if he wants to do as well. Great stuff. Well, thanks very much. Rob Hatch will be on British Eurosport for the next three weeks, the Giro d'Italia. Saturday lunchtime, British Eurosport if you're in the UK, Eurosport International if you're on the continent, or if you're down under, Eurosport Australia as well. All right, Rob, enough of that. <laughs> Come on our podcast. And I hope that'll be reciprocal. You can plug the podcast on, on during your uh, commentary. Why don't one of you come on and have a chat with us? We have a deal. We do. Brings a certain corporate veneer to our slipshod, shambolic routine, Rob does, doesn't he? Well, I don't know. Your Puddy remix was pretty corporate, Daniel. That was a good effort. Don't forget, t-shirts, thecyclingpodcast.com. Shop at thecyclingpodcast.com and sign up to become a friend of the podcast for £5 at thecyclingpodcast.com. That'll be us for this week. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.